Hello, I'm Pac-Man, and I'm declaring the winner of Anime 2022. That's it, fellas. Show's over. We have a champion. You can all go home now. Nothing to see. Anime 2022 is finished, and we have a winner. And how am I qualified to make such a statement? Well, you see, dear viewer, I have been a weeb for a long time. Almost three decades. I was into kaiju from age three and sentai through my youth. When I hit my teens, I finally found anime, and since then, I have seen a lot of anime. And so when you look among them, I have had more than my fair share of hits and misses, and even more of my fair share of weird ones. After all, my two favorite studios are Trigger and Kyoto Animation. The people behind, you know, Nichijou and Kill la Kill. That should give you an idea into my psyche, or rather, what little remains of it. I have a passion for two types of show. The incredibly deep, or just simply the incredible. Shows that make you think really hard, or render you unable to think, either from complete disbelief and shock at the insanity you just witnessed, or its quality for that matter, or simply emotional overload leaving you crying in a broken mess. Shout out to Violet Evergarden. But from Ghost in the Shell to Violet Evergarden to Death Note to Code Geass to Shinsekai Yori to Panty and Stocking to Konosuba to Promare to Zombieland Saga, idols and shoujo, action and fan service, emotional epics to horror and mystery, I've seen it all and I've done even more still. <clears throat> um, ignore that. So when I say, when I say in this year of 2022, this absolutely insane year of 2022, that I have just witnessed the greatest start to a series I have ever seen across both types of anime, if you know what I mean, I want to get across just how wild and insane this was. I mean, think back to the crazy openings you've seen. All the wild first episodes that have happened throughout the course of your weebdom. I mean, we've seen some good ones in the past, like Elfin Lead and Angel Beats for some of the older ones of us. Kill the Kill and School Live, the last one there is the most infamous in recent years, and it's also the best, by the way, which if you haven't seen, you need to, and go in blind. But like with School Live, I'm going to say this now, while it makes the video redundant. I must stress, I must absolutely paramountly stress that going in blind is the best way to experience this show today. Though the title and the artwork does give it away, really. It's pretty damn obvious what it's about. Not to mention the incredible amount of hype around it. I mean, it's been hyped up to absolute buggery. And despite all the insane competition this year, from episode one, I already know in my heart of hearts that if this show sticks to landing as season one and adapts its source material properly, it's going to be anime of the year. And that anime is, of course... Akiba Made War. That's right, bait and switch. It's not Chainsaw Man. It doesn't have a source material. It's an anime original. It's Akiba Made War. And what a fucking title. Just the name is incredible. I already want to watch it from the name alone. This, this is anime of the year 2022. There's no competition. Oh, come on, dude. Are you fucking kidding me? This year. You're saying that this year on an anime that has one episode out. Are you fucking serious? We've had Sasuke Timiano, Spy Family, Summertime Rendering, Ao Archie, Dance Dance Asura, Yofukashi no Uta, Mob Psycho, and Golden Kamoi all in one year, and you're gonna say this based on one hey, fucking hey, episode? Hey, Are you fucking hey, kidding me? Hey, dude, come on. Come up. on. Come on, dude. Look. Fuck off, V. This is my video. Go back to your hole. I will not be silenced. You can fucking try. You can fucking try. Take away my words. Get this out. is a freedom of speech issue. Get, 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 get out. Get out. Fuck. Jesus. Fucking Melbourne hipster. Okay, now that my co-host is gone, this is a good time to give you my official spoiler warning. This is the point of no return. Go watch it and come back. You have the title. You don't need anything else. You know what to watch. Just go, go watch it right now. But of course, if you ignore my highly qualified advice and want to stick around, look, I'm going to say this now. I got to this before Mother's Basement. He just talked about it in his seasonal roundup. I got to this first, all right? I know what I'm talking about. If you want to stick around and learn more, well, I can't stop you. Hit it! So like I said, this show just opens with a bang. Literally. A bang. It starts in 1985 with the head maid of one of the very first maid cafes in Akihabara getting whacked 
by a rival Maid Cafe's henchmaid. That's right. Maid Cafe Yakuza clans are not just a thing in this world, they are the dominant force in Akihabara, and it wouldn't surprise me if they are the dominant force in our world. I mean, look at their smiles. They can't be innocent. It's impossible. They have to be hiding souls of darkest black. All those Maid Cafes are definitely fronts for the Yakuza, with their overlord Faris Nyan Nyan ruling from the shadows, harnessing the power of time itself! Sorry, I had to make that reference. Gotta uphold that boomer weeb cred. But yes, this anime's premise is that the same underground networks that essentially ran the Japanese hospitality industry throughout the length of the 20th century were and are just as active in the maid cafe scene. And that of a night time as Takumi Fujiwara ran through the 90s in his AE86 around Mount Akina, maids are running and gunning through 90s Akihabara being operator as fuck, with extortion rackets, illegal casinos, and waging gang wars through the alleyways, all the while cleverly disguised from the public by serving their masters and holding idol concerts based on the theme of their cafe. From bunnies to pigs to magical girls from space, they live to cater to your every whim. They can sing like an angel, make a magical ice cream sundae, mix an incredible drink, or murder your enemies in order to establish their Moe brand supremacy. These maids are fucking strapped, to the point that, given enough organization, they could probably... Moe Moe Kyo for fire. Terrible jokes aside, however, which kind of defeats the purpose, because this is definitely a dark absurdist comedy in the vein of Tarantino and Kubrick, but bear with me. One of the things that I find rather incredible is how excellent a decision it was to set this anime in 1999. Both of us who run this channel are historians, and while V is the sociology and cultural historian by trade, modern Japanese history on the military, economic, and political side is just as interesting. The end of the Cold War, the entry of China into the markets, as well as Japan's insane inflation due to population explosion, unregulated economic growth through the 70s and 80s, combined with an absolutely moronic amount of asset speculation, not that we'd ever do that, <laughs> caused a huge economic collapse in the 90s. Imagine the collapse of the US housing market in 2008, just across the entirety of Japanese industry, although in their case as well, especially real estate. Due to this catastrophe, which was so bad Japan calls 1990-2000 to 2000 the lost decade, more and more people were out of work, forcing the state to cover huge welfare costs and scramble to try and prop up the failing system. Most of you watching would at least be old enough to remember the global financial crisis while having to deal with the economic crash caused by the pandemic. My generation had to handle both, so not fun, but moving past that, we can easily picture what effect this had on society in general. And of course, one of the biggest ones had to do with the government. Japan's political system is horrifically bureaucratic. It is also highly centralized while simultaneously very corporate orientated. So, like always, conservative governments say they're the party of small government, yet in Japan's case, being conservative actually means a more powerful one. It's complicated. American viewers might be a bit confused by what that is, so I just need to give you a little backstory, okay? Japan, during World War II, was essentially run by the military on one side and corporations known as Zaibatsu on the other. Now, you would think that like with Germany after Mustache Man was taken down, that America would dismantle these systems and put in place a new one, right? Wrong. The military was replaced by the old-school traditional conservatives, the old nobility and the well-to-do of Japan, while the big businesses, the Zaibatsu, kept all their shit and their social position. The most recognisable and famous of these, of course, is Mitsubishi, but the others are still there too. Point is, the same government that existed before World War II still exists today, and so you have a government made up of old rich men and old bureaucrats who will lose their jobs if the old rich men stop being rich. So, in the 90s, the Japanese government ran around in circles trying to fix things as being too big to fail. Stop me if you've heard that one before. Only to be so corrupt and so useless, again, stop me if you've heard that one before, that they achieved basically nothing. And this problem still persists. Shin Godzilla, the powerhouse kaiju film of recent times, is basically an outright attack against the Japanese bureaucracy and institutional corruption that led to the mishandling of the tsunami and Fukushima, as well as the various economic crises of the past three decades. But 
Before I go on too long of a rant, I'm sure you're wondering why you needed the history lesson. Mainly it's because my main channel is a military history channel and I do this for fun. Plus, both people who run this channel are historians, as I mentioned before. But the other main reason is all of the previous factors led to something that many nations around the world, most notably in modern culture, Mexico, Italy, and of course Japan, have been dealing with for a very long time. When governments fail to support their people, while the business world implodes in economic turmoil, the people have to fix it themselves, and when things are desperate, there is one solution, one secret ingredient, that tends to remedy the situation, and of course that secret ingredient is crime. Or in this case, organised crime. During economic depressions, mass unemployment necessitates increased government spending to stimulate the economy and to, of course, you know, keep people alive and shit. Very, very complicated content, I know, but bear with me. Thus, people are supported while encouraged to consume in order to jumpstart the market. But when there are no jobs, what do you consume? Simple. Entertainment. You've got nothing to do, so you have to find something to do. It's why Netflix, Uber Eats, and gaming and home media, like, all of these exploded during the pandemic. And when you don't have a plague, that entertainment includes bars, cinemas, and restaurants. But due to the financial volatility of the economy and the lack of liquidity in said economy, banks and the government aren't much of a help. So who finances and runs all of these business ventures? Who operates all the bars, clubs, and the other venues while offering loans and security for expanding your businesses? Simple. The Mafia. Or rather, in this case, the Yakuza. And in Japan, the Yakuza have a key role in the local landscape. They are often seen as pillars of the community in some cases, handling problems that can't be solved or take too long to be solved through official channels. They hold festivals, provide security, they even coordinate and run disaster relief in some cases. And due to the economic crises of the 1990s, the Yakuza were at the height of their power in modern times. From Bosuzoku bikers to business owners, they were omnipresent. And so, by setting it in the 90s, this made cafe Yakuza premise is absolute fucking genius. And the genius is even in the title because it's a pun. The title is a pun. Medo is Japanese for maid. Of course, it's the uh, transliteration of English, right? But Medo is also how you say underworld in some kanji. Just, ah! Oh, it's a pun. The title is a pun. It's, it's so good. And the authenticity brought by this historical setting is the absolute cherry on top for me. Just everything is so authentic. The feeling like... Wait. Oh, God. There's a reason why I recognize the authenticity. Okay, yeah, look, let's just forget that I am using terminology like historical setting and historical authenticity for a time that I was fucking alive for. I was... I had my first day of school in 1999. I rem... Oh, God, this is getting ty tiring. Cut. Ty I, I can't do this. Cut. Cut. But more than that, it also allows for a gorgeous and nostalgic aesthetic. This show is just oozing and dripping with style. And the style is simultaneously modern, but retro. The color palette and animation is immaculate, folding in that late 90s, early 2000s anime aesthetic with the modern drawing techniques and the technological advances in what uh, Mother's Basement calls waifuology. The character designs and the overall setup are distinctly contemporary, and they are of contemporary quality while being transported into the era of Initial D, Death Note, and Monster. The juxtaposition between shady illegal casinos among the back alleys and the colourful neon of the Akiba main strip is just wonderful to behold, and the attention to detail is stunning. Akiba looks just as it did in the 1990s. Those familiar with Steinscape will recognize all of the major buildings which are faithfully represented, but the 90s was only the beginning of the otaku boom which would ultimately consume the district during the 2000s, and as such, it's still very much in this anime the grungy original urban sprawl of Tokyo. 
Akihabara was a major rail terminal, and after World War II leveled Tokyo, it was one of the areas still functioning, and so the Yakuza took over the district, opening a large number of storefronts, selling black market goods. Among the most sought after items were, of course, heaters and fans and electrical goods, and other technical items obtained from the American occupation forces and government trucks that had a failure of their securing straps, which the Yakuza, of course, began to steal. That being uh, strategically transferring equipment to alternate locations, for those of you who are unaware. But anyway. In the changing times of the Japanese economic miracle, these businesses became legitimate storefronts, selling the latest products from Toshiba and Sony and so on. TVs, stereos, white goods, and of course, eventually, home computers. Thus it earned the name Electric City, which in turn, due to the computing industry, attracted the nerds. Hence, the Maid Cafe Yakuza springing up in the 80s as a result, and thus we now have Weeb Mecca today. So, think about this. Akihabara was a Yakuza town. It then became the hub for nerds because of its focus on electronics and computers, which then in turn leads to Maid Cafe Yakuza. It's genius! <laughs> this show appears on the surface to just be another careless mashup of genres. You know, a quick cash grab, an idol show, an action show, and moe slice of life. Cute maids join the Yakuza. I mean, after all, we've had Yakuza babysitters and Yakuza golfers, so it makes sense that this is the next step. But like with those shows, there is much more beneath the surface, and given this historical context and the obvious deconstructive satire of all of those genres, oh, it's incredible. I have watched all currently available episodes multiple times. I have to say that because I'm writing as of episode two right now, but I know there's going to be another one before this comes out, and I will have watched that one multiple times as well. And when I say multiple, I mean six or seven, not one or two, six or seven times. I have been showing this show to everyone I can. It's that good. So the style is excellent. The art is excellent. The setting is is great. The comedy and the premise hit like truck kun during isekai season, which of course leads to Eminent in Shadow, but that that's another cool anime you need to watch. But anyway, how does the soundtrack and the animation stack up? Well, I could discuss it, but instead, seeing as you haven't heeded my spoiler warning, I will assume you aren't concerned for spoilers, so I'll simply sell you the show by demonstrating it. Observe. That just about sums it up, really. As you can see, the animation and the OST are incredible. The opening is very reminiscent of Black Lagoon, while the ending is a parody version of a James Bond opening title. A ballad lamenting the life lived in the shadows, how love, lust, and lethality intertwine among infinite tragedy. In short, the animation is immaculate, the soundtrack bangers, the premise perfection, the art style exquisite, and its execution well, let's just say execution is an apt description given the body count, and like the body count, it gets the highest of marks. If nothing else, it has to be the best first episode I have ever seen, and as I have established, I do not say that lightly. In any case, you should have already left to go watch it about three minutes ago. So, go do that. Go watch. You should have already bought the premise by now. Go watch it immediately. So, also, but before you do, actually... Please like and subscribe. Get us up to a thousand. We'd really appreciate it. Otherwise, you know, I'll have to moe moe McEnge!